believe that in the last couple of weeks, Venerable Apeka has been uh, uh, inspiring you all with her sort of discussions in my absence. And today you have all of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, that doesn't mean that only we want to give our perspective. We also invite everybody. This is called a uh, sort of discussion group. So it's really about bringing this to life in a way that's meaningful for you and actually um, seeing how we might apply some of these teachings to our own struggles, our own inspiration or whatever it is that um, can be applied to your practice. And uh, someone very kindly wrote the page that we're on for those who are new. Uh, please don't worry if you don't have the book, we'll be reading it out. And we'll, it's not so much an intellectual study, as I say, it's more a, a practical kind of discussion about what these sutras might mean for us and how they can help us in our lives. So uh, so we'll just begin. And usually I start reading um, probably part of it and then open for any questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can either raise your virtual hand, which is under the participants button, or you might have a separate virtual hand button. And, um, and we'll unmute you. So we are recording, but when you're unmuted, you, only your voice will be recorded. The video will stay on us. But if you prefer, you can ask it in the chat box if you prefer not to uh, have your voice on recording. But people do love to hear from different people. It makes it a lot more accessible and alive. So I'll begin. It's page 131, and this is from the Digger Nikaya number 21. And uh, it's a new chapter this week. Last week it was... Uh, finishing off the intentional community. And this week it's disputes. It's interesting, isn't it? That we start off with an intentional community and then we <laughs> move on to disputes. <laughs> what do they call it? Forming, storming or storming, forming and something else anyway, norming or something. So this is the storming phase now. We can read about what come up for us. So. Is the sound okay for everybody, first of all? Yeah, great. All right, here we go. Why do beings live in hate? Which is a strong word, but of course, that is taken to mean here any kind of aversion, irritation, frustration, you know, um, dispute. Saka, ruler of the devas, asked the blessed one, beings wish to live without hate, hostility or enmity. They wish to live in peace. Yet they live in hate, harming one another, hostile and as enemies. By what fetters are they bound, sir, that they live in such a way? And the Blessed One said, Ruler of the Devas, it's the bonds of envy and miserliness that bind beings so that although Though they wish to live without hate, hostility or enmity, and to live in peace, yet they live in hate, harming one another, hostile, and as enemies. Saka, delighted, exclaimed, So it is, then, blessed one, so it is, fortunate one. Through the blessed one's answer, I've overcome my doubt and gotten rid of uncertainty. Then Saka, having expressed his appreciation, asked another question. But what, sir, gives rise to envy and miserliness? What is their origin? How are they born? How do they arise? When what is present do they arise? And when what is absent do they not arise? <laughs> so it's interesting here, isn't it, that we're digging back into the sequence of causality, which is very... Um, um, it's a standard kind of framework that's used across the Buddhist text and across the Dhamma that we always have to look back. What caused this to arise and what caused that to arise to, that gave rise to this? So I find this very nice that we're kind of looking for the, for the cause of things and not stopping at the uh, apparent result. So he says here, <clears throat> envy and miserliness arise from liking and disliking. This is their origin. This is how they are born and how they arise. When these are present, they arise. When these are absent, they do not arise. Ah. So if there's no liking or disliking, 
There can't be any envy or miserliness. That's interesting. But what, sir, gives rise to liking and disliking? <clears throat> they arise from desire. So here it's skipping a bit, uh, which is a bit of a shame, actually. Maybe I'll read the whole yeah, sentence. Read the they thing. arise from desire. This is their origin. This is how they are born. This is how they arise. When these are present, they arise. When these are absent, they do not arise. And what gives rise to desire? Uh, what gives rise to desire? What is their origin? How is desire, in this case, born? And how does desire arise? When what is present, does desire arise? And when what is absent, does it not arise? Desire arises from liking and... No, no. Desire arises from um, liking and desire. No, from thinking. Oh, yes. Yeah, it desire. arises from thinking. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm. That is its origin. That is how it's born. And that is how it's arise. It arises. When thinking is present, desire arises. But when thinking is absent, it does not arise. My goodness. Is that the whole of the teaching to overcome thinking? <laughs> but, sir, what gives rise to thinking? Um, what is its origin? How is it born? And how does thinking arise? When what is present, does thinking arise? And when what is absent, does it not arise? Thinking, ruler of the devas, arises from elaborated perceptions and notions. Is that sometimes talked about as conceivings, isn't it? Perceptions and conceivings, I think, as well. When elaborated perceptions and notions are present, thinking arises. When elaborated perceptions and notions are absent, thinking does not arise. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so this is quite a rich and lesser known sequence of uh, dependent origination and, and one of the sequences, because, of course, we have desire or wanting greed in the dependent origination as well. And in there, it's a little bit more um, it's looking more existential arising of these things. So um, the prelude to desire in that case is Vedana, is feelings giving rise to um, craving and then clinging. And uh, before feelings is like the whole, um, the contact between the objects of the senses and the, um, and the sense bases. So obviously that's talking at a, a kind of deeper level in a sense, but this gives another kind of pathway into how desires can at least be, um, can be increased, right? How desire can um, uh, arise. So it can come from thinking. Right. When the mind thinks of nothing. Oh, look, we missed that bit. When the mind thinks of nothing, desire does not arise. OK, so desire does not arise when the mind thinks of nothing. But um, I don't think this means desire is not there. So perhaps it's talking about the immediate arising of these things. So anyway, this is. Uh, <laughs> OK, so Shirley's confused. Yeah, yeah so. Read, just yeah, I can read it through again without all the um, uh, the repetition. Mm. So we started off here with the bonds of envy and miserliness that binds beings so that although they wish to live without hate, hostility or enmity they, and to live in peace, yet they live in hate, harming one another, hostile and as enemies. So then Saka asked the Buddha, what gives rise to envy and miserliness? And the Buddha says they arise from liking and disliking. But what gives rise to liking and disliking? Liking and disliking arise from desire. What gives rise to desire? Desire arises from thinking. When the mind thinks about something, desire arises. When the mind thinks of nothing, it does not arise. And then he asked, but what, sir, gives rise to thinking? Thinking, ruler of the devas, arises from elaborated perceptions and notions or conceivings. 
when elaborated perceptions and notions are present, thinking arises. When elaborated perceptions and notions are absent, thinking does not arise. Okay. So, in a sense, if you look at it backwards, we're saying that elaborated perceptions and notions are the cause of all the other things here. So, elaborated perceptions and notions give rise to thoughts, which give rise to desire, which give rise to liking and disliking, um, and which give rise to envy and wiseliness. So, this is one sequence. It's not the only sequence. And I think this is where sometimes confusion can arise. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't other ways it could go. But in this particular one, we're talking about how um, these things lead to uh, beings living in hate and harming each other, hostile and as enemies, with, uh, with jealousy and miserliness. So this is the social and communal harmony topic, and this is our main uh, interest here, how to live in harmony. Mm -hmm. So I think that's quite interesting that the mm. whole sequence toward disharmony starts with elaborated perceptions Perception. and notions. <laughs> and I think, yeah, all of us are sort of <laughs> laughing a little because in community, and I'm sure this uh, stands for your communities too, whether your workplace or family or um, any society that you're part of, um, certainly in monasteries, one of the most difficult things living in community is the kind of projections and misunderstandings, misinterpretations, mm. Um, mm. Uh, presumptions mm. that can arise, you know, because we live with pe people who have different conditioning mm. to us, mm. um, often very, very different backgrounds, um, from different cultures, uh, different ages, and maybe even coming to the monastic life for different reasons too. So naively in the beginning of my monastic life I thought that oh great I'm going to have all these friends that are just like me they've all come because they meditate they want to practice this method and they want to you know <laughs> realize the dhamma they're a certain type of character and then you know especially when I entered communities that were not based on meditation alone I realized that people are very very different mm -hmm. and you're all put into that community together like it or lump it and you have to kind of learn to live and learn from it. Um, and one of the most dangerous things to harmony, I think, is, uh, is just getting an idea in your head about somebody and where they're coming from and what they meant by what they said. That mm -hmm. could be completely off course, you know, could be completely off course, because what do we really know about another person? Actually, nothing. Most of the time we're reacting to how we feel when something said or someone does something it's like there's a feeling that happens right in the body that's the contact that gives rise to feeling and we don't like that feeling mm. or we might be like that feeling and then no oh, a wonderful person yeah. <laughs> mm. right oh. uh, yeah that sutta goes on interestingly enough, yeah about what is the correct what are thoughts that what thoughts should you have what how do you yeah. think uh -huh. what, how should you you know what are the correct elaborated perceptions uh -huh. and uh -huh. the, uh, um, so that's an interesting question you know right we do have we do have perceptions but which one is right and this is actually something that goes I mean, in in community, everybody thinks they're right. <laughs> I mean, I think by default, human beings think they're right because you don't think thoughts that you think are wrong, right? Whatever you think, you think it's right. I mean, we yeah. don't intentionally... Yeah, and they're all good people. <laughs> they're yeah. all oh, good yeah. people in, in monasteries and everybody's very high-minded and everybody's right. <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah, is this yeah. is uh i i struggled a lot with this because yeah. you know there are many ways to run a monastery and there's mm -hmm. many ways mm -hmm. to uh live uh yeah to run a monastery so but what is the right way to run a monastery um but interesting what the sutta does say is that what is leads to wholesome states of yeah. mind mm. goes uh, leads to nibbana and leads away from uh greed hatred and delusion mm. that is what is right what 
exactly yes. exactly that is what is right thought yeah or, yeah you know. and I think this idea of elaborated perceptions and notions I mean the problem with that is the, the elaboration right the the bit we add on um mm. I guess the I'm not sure if the word's propensure or not it, it is uh, yeah propensure sanya sankara right yeah, yeah. yeah. so sankara is more like reactivity or it's yeah what we create it's what we fabricate um and papancha is like a wonderful word because it sounds like it, 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 the meaning which is just uh proliferating and building things up you know kind of spinning off further and further away from reality and I guess mm. that's one of the troubles with thinking you know it's arising after something's happened and it's what we put onto it like this evening mm. I mean this isn't really on topic but it's interesting when we ask one another in community, so how did you come to the Dhamma? And everyone thinks for a while and then they they make a story about how mm. they came to the Dhamma. And I do it all the time. And then I realise all I'm doing is kind of overlaying something that happened a long time ago, which was process, with a kind of intellectual conception, which is actually probably not at all what happened. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you remember so, the good bits or the bad bits? Yeah. Or the bad? And the certain bits you keep remembering yeah. and become the prominent bit, you know, whereas actually there were probably loads and loads of other bits. Right. That and you ask somebody else, and they have a completely different version. <laughs> yeah. Of what happened. Right, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's quite interesting because yeah. I think this is sort of showing us the danger really in um, allowing our thoughts mm. to run wild mm. and... Not even one while, just to believe them. I mean, right. for me, I initially thought, what well, because I thought it, it must be true. Mm. I, I, we almost taught that in, in, in yeah. school, you know, yeah. if it feels right, you analyzed it correctly. Yeah, yeah. It you must get a be star. Right. It, it, it's, <laughs> you get a gold star. Yeah, you, you, you're right. Yeah. Um, and then you've got, you've got something, right? People yeah. feel that when they, they've, uh, thought about something well then they've got somewhere but mm. really you haven't got very far mm. I'm going to come to the chat just because we do have a few questions um coming in and we're getting all very excited over here <laughs> <coughs> fully displaying exactly what the suit is about <laughs> um and we'll come to the chat and then we can perhaps uh bring in Aya a little yes, bit as well um yeah yeah I want you not to fall off the edge of the screen there we go Right. I'm confused, Shirley says. Mm -hmm. Independent origination doesn't desire arise from liking and disliking, Vedana. Um, well, Vedana is more classified as effective feeling tone, you could say, or effective tone of experience. So it's kind of experience that's pleasant, mm -hmm. unpleasant or neutral, but it's not the actual liking or disliking of it. It's the actual feeling itself. Um, the liking or disliking to me would be more like Sankara be more like the reaction to it that would be the mm. desire basically because you either want it or you don't mm. want it and mm. both are desire right both mm. are kind of a, um mm. yeah whether you want or don't want something mm. it's a it's a um it's a reactivity yes and i think the buddha has different uh ways of depending on who he's speaking to yeah. uh, uh relating to that person at that time in this case sakka so I mean, he's not giving the teaching on dependent origination. Yeah. He's giving a teaching on what can lead to envy and miserliness as a cause for dispute. Mm. So it's a different um, uh, sequence. But I think uh, maybe the liking and disliking part was confused for vain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, naturally, we're going to, uh, we're primed, isn't it, to kind of move in toward pleasant feeling and move away, mm. uh, pull away or avert ourselves from from unpleasant feeling but um part of the practice is to learn to see that all feeling is impermanent and is not self and is ultimately not really worth getting too worked mm. up about <laughs> uh and staying kind of um staying cool mm. in the midst of pleasant and unpleasant mm. I don't understand what's meant by elaborated notions and perception. Mm. Do you want to speak to that? I think I'll say a little bit. It's, it's very interesting. I like the way it's phrased, actually. And I think yeah. it's what we do it all the time without noticing. So um, Can you hear okay? we were speaking earlier about relationships you know, and how um, it, it seems like, you know, like the, 
like two people meet and they have a conversation and they, you know, I, I meet, say, I opaque her and, and then I have an idea of who she is, what she's like, she meets me, it's the same thing. And then actually there'll be some truth in it and there'll be some elaboration, there'll be some, um, there'll be, and, and there'll be certain things that will that are maybe fill in the gaps and she'll fill in the gaps and then they'll and then if you live with somebody you know you're with them a lot so then there'll be certain patterns that are created between you together that you know arise in from often from old habits and old, or old conditioning and they're not necessarily you know how one perceives what's going on isn't necessarily what's actually going on often mm. so what you might mm. feel Gosh, they're really, they're so, uh, they're making me really stressed by being so, so uh, strict or so anxious, whatever it is. And, and then we, we sort of overlay, we, cr we create, we elaborate on what's going on. And then we have our old perceptions from the past. So when, when I was growing up and my father did that, it was, it, this thing happened. And so she's doing that now and it's, this thing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we, we, it all gets sort of tangled together the old patterning and perceptions mm. and then the, what's actually happening in the present mm. so often there's a sort of an, a, a lot of overlay in the present mm. on what's actually happening and this suit is kind of bringing it back to something very very simple of just mm. kind of just being actually that's what it's bringing it back to just mm. being experiencing receiving without adding on top of like i like it i don't like it, i'm afraid mm. I, I want you know all of that overlay is just is just saying just just be with it as it is right when you said overlay i think that relates to a projection as well projection yeah yeah. yeah which i'm never quite sure how to explain i don't know how would you explain this i think it's connected with perception isn't it because mm. it's often related to things that we've known in the past, in the past yeah the way mm. we've been conditioned in the past culturally or in our family or through trauma all of those things they they mm. <clears throat> influence the way we experience life right and then somebody comes into that you know somebody meets us and then all of that comes in mm. on yeah. Of experience. yeah both ways both ways yeah, yeah. it's basically we're getting a real tangle and it becomes extremely hard to um, untangle because we're moving away from direct experience. I think that's mm, one way exactly. I understand it. You know, direct experience is what you know in this moment. It's not what you think about it. Ajahn Brahm always says thinking about, about is like literally means around something. Mm, yeah. You know, it's not thinking into it. You can't think into something. You can feel into something, but you can't think into it. Um, I think that works fine. It's a good point. So, and it's interesting to see what Minori wrote that um, uh, here he's saying that um, elaborated notions and perceptions also relates to, refers to cravings, conceit mm -hmm. and views, because mm -hmm. I think this is another thing that can really lead yes. to a lot of uh, difficulty in community if we feel that things should be a certain way, we have a view, you know, that, um, you know, people should always be calm and, and people should like give you a hug when you're upset or you know that kind of thing and then it doesn't happen and we get so upset because we expect to love to look one way or we expect support to look one way or and someone else sees it differently and the conceit as well and that's important because we have this sense of I am a such and such type of person and if something happens that challenges your self-view this is really where it gets interesting you know, especially if you kind of pride yourself on being the one that pleases and then suddenly someone's not very happy and it's your fault and you have to fix it. You have to fix them, you know, because that hurts yourself. You it's not really because you. it might be involved with caring for the person. But often what we do is protect ourselves for you at all costs, um, which is interesting. And that comes from conceit and view, doesn't it? Personality mm. view. Craving, yeah. mm, craving as well want, yeah. yeah wanting to be perceived, to be perceived yeah. a certain <laughs> way <laughs> and we can't be because people's perceptions change even if somebody perceives me as this kind generous person they might perceive me that way for about five minutes and then they'll perceive me as something different especially if I say no to something they want isn't it <laughs> if you say yes to things people want they say oh she's so kind <laughs> <laughs> because you're satisfying somebody's wants mm. 
But if you say no, this is, I struggle because I find it hard sometimes to say no. And part of that is because I actually want to please people. And another part is because I feel it's not good to say no. Like I've been kind of conditioned by my parents to always say yes. So if I have to say, can somebody do something that I know they probably don't want to do? Or I have to say no to something that challenges my self view because then I don't feel like a good person, you know? I don't know. I mean, you might not know. Um, but I think this is a quite a deep conditioning for me. And I think maybe I'm guessing, especially for women on the whole, mm. that we're conditioned to really give a lot and please and keep the harmony and look out for everyone else. And um, mm. yeah, mm. I don't know. Mm. I think mm, other people might relate mm. to that perhaps. Uh yeah. Anyway, we're speaking a lot and I'm just aware that there's still some comments I'd like to mention, but I'd also like to open up for hearing your voices because that's when it gets more interactive. So I'll just uh, see if I can go through these a little bit. Do you want to go for that? Okay. I think contextualizing outcome, the disharmony and conflict dissolves the mm. gaps or insufficiencies in the causal sequence i was unconvinced until that question outcome mm. was reiterated mm. yeah 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 i think mm. so noticing that this sequence is basically all about um uh one way that disharmony can occur yeah yeah it's not a full complete description mm. of reality and the only way thinking can arise or desire can arise or, but it's a particular way that it can no eyes in relation to miserliness, etc. I think I see a lot of. Do you want to read that one? Okay. I think I see a lot of the thoughts that run through my head are ca casually, ca causally, must be ca causally conditioned by the stories, conversations, and media I'm exposed to and I'm drawn towards. This is why adverts and such can mm. be quite influential and why right speech is so important don't watch TV absolutely because <laughs> right speech isn't only talking to each other it's also yeah. what we talk to in yeah. social media what we have into our head because whenever you read an article yeah. that's an article speaking to you you know whatever you watch on the movie that movie is speaking to you it's like having a person mm. in the room my dad used to get so irate mm. when Donald Trump would be on the <laughs> telly you know because I mean my family are not that way inclined <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, I'm happy to say because I must be right. But um, <laughs> um, And I'd be like, why are you having him in your living room? Uh, Two or three times every evening as the same newsreel comes around. You can't stand the person. You're getting red in the face and bitter and shouting at the TV, feeling that, you know, the whole world's just going wrong. And why do you have him in your living room? You know, why don't you play? I don't know a talk or <laughs> he did actually occasionally listen to a dhamma talk um mm. yeah so sometimes we think this won't have an effect but it does it does mm. you start having the same emotions that you dislike in the other right mm. the hatred the bitterness mm. so you have mm. to be very careful mm. Mm. Are, are elaborated perceptions and notions craving conceit distorted views yeah, as per the footnote or reference. Yeah, yes. they can definitely be related to that. Um, I mean, I guess those things are sort of causes for elaborated perceptions. They're not equivalent to necessarily. Elaborated perceptions can come from ignorance, can come from all sorts of things, daydreaming, fantasizing. I mean, yeah, I guess this sort of view in the sense that at that moment you're not aware of what you're doing and that it's harmful as well. Because part of right view is knowing what's harmful and what's not. Oh, Matisha's here. Uh, yeah, so I think you... part of what it's pointing to is it's fabricated. Yeah, you know, that's also mm -hmm. a really important piece. Uh, that when we're when there's envy, when there's miseries, it's, it's coming from a fabricated misperception of reality. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's essential. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, someone's asking about the Pali words. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, sort of discussion to start going into the Pali and exploring the translation now. But certainly, if you want to do that afterwards, it'd be great. Somebody's uh, Adrian's very great at mm. finding the words mm -hmm. quickly. Papancha Sanya Sankha is the word, which means basically what we said. It's like Sanya's perception. Sankha is like kind of fabrication. So perceiving in a fabricated way, like it's more and more embellished and Papancha is that proliferation. So, but I really want to open up 
up for people to talk about how these things affect their own lives and you know just as we've given some examples and uh I'd love to hear more from you too but also from the group about um about how this plays out for you or anything you're struggling with that this could speak to Bill may I ask Ramud please Hi Bill. Good evening. How are you? Good. So yeah. I'm living this, what you're talking about, in the present right now. Without getting into details, my son is heading down a path that um, is not good. And so much of, so when I first caught him, I lost it. You know, I intense amount of anger and frustration. Um, and I could see where those feelings came from. Part was a fear for a 13 year old and where he's going and projecting into the future. And then part of it was my own ego. I could see how could my son do this kind of thing? How could he be involved? Then perceptions of the, he was involved with another kid and then I wanted to meet the parents and not for any positive reason but to kind of scold them you know how could your son do this with my son and all of it was about ego and fear of the future my projection of where things were going not just the what he had done was severe enough mm. but on top of that what, so much of it is about the future about what this means where it could go is yeah. how he could ruin his life if he mm. down a certain path yeah that must be so stressful mm. which is why I'm not on the square today, which is great to this, mm -hmm. what we're talking about, speaks volumes mm -hmm. to exactly where mm -hmm. I am. I'm constantly bringing myself back, mm -hmm. present moment. i doing all the things I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I can't control his future. Right. I can only lay up. Yeah, wow. Um, Part of it's, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it sounds very tough because uh, mm. it's true what you say about you can't control it. You can't control the future of your children. It's true. And, you know, you can do what you can because it's like, it's not just about, okay, I'll just be present and just notice. You know, there's also maybe things you, you are doing or can do that it will shake him up and wake him up. And, you know, it, it, you, I think one has to try to do what one can also, mm -hmm. but not then to get lost in proliferation of like, oh gosh, and then this will happen, then that will happen, or, you know, I think about that uh, suit where the Buddha is um, talking to a, a man with a baby on his lap, and then he says, if the baby starts choking, uh, he's sucking, uh, if the baby starts choking on a stone, would you just let him choke, or would you put your finger in the mouth and pull that stone out? And, and even if it even if it would draw blood, you know, you get in and pull it out. And mm. That's what comes to mind when you're talking about your son. Actually, is like, well, maybe there are mm. some things you can do mm. that are compassionate. Mm. You know, that might help him. You can't just, you know, who knows? His karma is his karma, but you might be able to help him to to um, reflect or sh or um, mm. see the danger in, in what he's doing. Mm. It's possible. Oh yeah, and we're we're as a parents we're, we're doing all that and then the resistance to it even though we're trying to do things to help mm -hmm. he takes it as a punishment yeah yeah maybe reiterating just how much you love him and yeah. even if he doesn't take that on board you will still be there that's good mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. we've had up we've been I'll stop. We went to empty cloud once and we're going again. Good. And uh, okay. uh, Arjan Medico sat with him. I'm trying to make an appointment for right. my, my son related with him. Good. I want to set an appointment for him to meet with Arjan Medico again. Fabulous. I have another. 
Arjan said nothing I didn't already say. But yeah. when it comes from a monastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Kind of it goes the other way too. My parents listen to her and Bama. They don't tell me. They tell my sister. They wouldn't tell me. They wouldn't admit that they would do something that I would recognize. <laughs> it ju it's just like that. It's too much self-identification. Mm -hmm. You're doing a great job, Bill, really. Mm -hmm. Just see if you can catch Thank that you. when it starts to go into worst case scenario, because it's not going to go into that scenario. It could go into another one that's bad, mm -hmm. but it, it can't get to what it's going to do. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know. You've just got to be there with where you're at now as much as possible but I feel for you because I have no idea mm. how hard it must be mm. and I wouldn't mm. ah, it's tough mm. it will change yeah that it will and that and relying on the dharma and the teachings mm. does help bring right. a sense of peace well done awesome. well mm. done well done thank you as well because it's hard to come to these things when you're not feeling the best of moods but it's good mm. that you did all right, can we come to Mukund? Mukund, may I ask you to unmute, please? Hello, Mukund. Hello. Good to see you again, Venerable, after a few mm -hmm. weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, you know, Bill, you just uh, uh, sparked a thought for me, and uh, I, I found that, you know, in, in some really tough personal situations when it feels like them had a similar reaction what's going to happen in the future and and, and the fear of it um, and how do I solve for this and I found that you know I can I, I would find that I can think of so many things and you know potential solutions but I can't solve for them all but the only thing I can solve for is myself mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense you know my approach was to say okay Am I in the best possible state of mind, given whatever stresses and pressure and tension to deal with something? And uh, especially with with children, I think that 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 uh, for me that was very valuable because often they they really need us when they behave in a way like they really don't need us. <laughs> and, and, and and somewhere deep down inside, I think they they know it, but they won't admit it. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, just a few thoughts. It makes me wonder when you said they know it, but they won't admit it. It makes me have compassion and wonder whether they know they're really not doing good and they want to be doing better and they want to show you they can be doing better. That's why they don't want you to tell them. Maybe. I don't know. Ishk, it's so tough being a teenager. If they if your son is a teenager, I don't know. 13, 13 years. Yeah. So about to say the word okay can we can you unmute the yeah hello I so, hi yes, hello so lovely to see three of you there <laughs> yeah that, i like it. The explanation of the um was it elaborated perceptions that was really clear that really like, resonated and what, also what you were saying very chandra about I could relate exactly to what you were saying about wanting to please people. I've I've got like these two parts to me where sometimes, mm -hmm. especially say at work or there's certain things where I think it has to be this way. This is the right way. And then other times, um, but at the same time, I don't want to upset people. Yeah. So when they don't do it that way, I get annoyed. Mm -hmm. And then I think, oh, I've got to tell them yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And then you have like this inner conflict. <laughs> And then often I may even come across badly yeah, yeah. because I've got this in a conflict. Exactly, so exactly. I find it really hard, especially I think in work, because I think with work, well, work has to be this way because it's work, you know, right. it's a business. And, but, yeah. um, but I've definitely got a lot better at it. Oh, I believe I have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but those explanations of, uh, of oh, and the other thing is the fabrications. Mm. I like that. Like, you know, thoughts are mm -hmm. and I've noticed that actually I've said something to my, so I worked with my brother something recently and we've had some problems not not me and him but taking the energy out of things like when it, I've had comments said to me for example and it was just ridiculous because actually those comments I didn't do the thing that I was accused yeah. of that aimed at me right and when I reflected afterwards and I didn't react I thought I'm going to wait I got all 
you know, emotional. And then when I waited, I kind of laughed at it. <laughs> That's good. Like, that, that wasn't even meant for me that was ridiculous you know but yeah and everyone else has said you know that's I can't control other people I can only do my bit mm. and by reacting that's going to make things mm. things work uh, but yeah I mean still still find things difficult you know and it's difficult and actually that just kind of leads on to what Bill was saying about I think that's amazing that you've had that you, that perception and mindfulness and that honesty with yourself that's that's so hard that is one of the hardest things if you've already got that then then surely that can only help and actually the thing I think you said about love I've I've seen in family that you know seen people that have been pulled out of friendship groups because they were going down a wrong route I say wrong, you know, like people sort of getting into crime mm. and then potentially them not feeling, even though their parents were always there for them, that they're so loved. Mm. And I think if you just make it really clear, obviously I, I'm not at this stage of my parents. <laughs> uh, if, if you make it really clear that, I th that, you know, the love, and I guess that's meta, right? Mm. That's, that's what we're, we're really trying to do with it as well. I think people... People need to hear it said. Yeah. I yeah. say almost every day that I'm grateful for the people I'm around, you know, because I, I mean, maybe it's because I need to hear it said to me, but I actually think people need to hear it said. Yeah, you know, even you said something to me the other day about Ajima, you said, of course, he cares for you so much. And I'm like, oh, really? I mean, I kind of know it, but you're like, it's obvious. It's like, it's not obvious because I don't hear it. I mean, we don't hear these things, you know, and, and then we get our, we're insecure. Yeah. Beings are kind of fragile and insecure, and I think you can never say it too many times. Yeah, and then, yeah, but sometimes the person doesn't hear it. Like yeah. I know, yeah, yeah it takes they just, time. They, they they just don't hear it. But it's even more reason to keep saying it. Well, yeah, don't you think? I I don't know. Like my brother, for yeah. example, yeah, always thought I wasn't close to him mm, well, I, mm. or either his parents judged him or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. but they never did and they maybe they don't say we don't judge you <laughs> but he, he just didn't hear it he just he didn't, didn't hear, hear it, it. He didn't but hear now it. And now he does to go in 48 <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. It's I'm a combination saying, isn't it yeah. actions and words I guess mm. and uh, maturity right, right. Yeah. Wow. I really admire all the parents in this room. Mm. And by the way, I just keep smiling because I'm seeing Annette and Grace there. Oh. And <laughs> they're ah. smiling when Sean's talking because these are all our ex-guests. Uh -huh. And they're all together, look. We all yeah, come to yeah. visit each other. Oh, it's just enjoyable to see you. Hello. <laughs> Love you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and Susie, of course. I, were you there when mm. she was there alongside Grace yeah. Joss? Yeah. They just overlapped, right? Yeah. 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 So uh -huh. nice. Anyway. Hopefully mm. more of you will come. Well, you'll all come back mm. at least. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else from the group? Mm. It'd be kind of interesting if um, anyone wishes to talk about the miserly envy part because um, I guess that's something we don't always see in ourselves and we don't want to mm. kind of admit it in ourselves. But I find that interesting mm. that that's the proximate cause mm. for this hostility and enmity and harming one another, that it's this uh, mm. envy and miserliness. Mm. Because I guess enmity, in a way, is the opposite. Enmity, right. Does it say enmity or envy? I read envy before. In, envy. In <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I thought it was envy. envy. Yeah, it yeah, it's envy that. and yeah. enmity. Yeah. But yeah, the envy part I found mm. interesting. Because yeah. I've noticed for myself, mm. like, for example, I had one friend. And I sort of think of her as a friend. But then mm. I would always sense that there was a jealousy there. And I noticed that because of that, I couldn't fully trust her because mm. I felt like she wasn't fully invested in me doing well. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it was mm. okay so long as I stayed kind of the same as her or something mm. or like a bit less. Mm. But if I was thriving, there was mm. a jealousy. Mm. And then I thought, well, does that mean they don't want me to thrive then? So then I couldn't mm. fully trust. Mm. And I realized that that time how harmful trust it can be when we have um jealousy mm -hmm. as opposed to having you know mudita like rejoicing in other people's affairs and goodness mm -hmm. and even maybe spiritual 
spiritual insight. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people, even among the Sangha, can get envious or can be resentful, say, that person, they can't be enlightened, you know, <laughs> which is very sad, actually, you know, because maybe they are, maybe they're not, but maybe they are. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if anybody has struggles with that i think it's something probably we all feel from time to time envy and uh i don't know grace and annette are smiling so much do you want to say anything it would be lovely to hear you they're so sweet together <laughs> my goodness Shirley, <laughs> come to Shirley. it doesn't have to be on that but i'm just inviting it yeah, it's really interesting because they're not the sort of emotions that would spring to mind when you think of conflict and hatred arising. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're quite sort of, I've been sort of, as you were saying, I was sort of thinking about it and I was thinking, do I really, do I, is it, do I really agree with this? And then I said, this, this, this envy and miserliness, that it's a sort of subtle mean mindedness. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which uh, it's that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I just sort of think this subtle mean mindedness that we don't like to, uh, you know, we acknowledge it if we sort of, I mean, have a big row with somebody because we have a different a difference of opinion. And I think, you know, have it having different opinions about things, you know, like uh, your dad not liking Donald Trump, that's <laughs> very, very obvious and it's sort of in your face. But you know, I'm just, uh, you know, just a little reflection. This sort of very subtle mean mindedness. Oh. We don't often, we don't often. Well, I don't. I don't. You know, I don't sort of really reflect on that because it is sort of, it, it is sort of very subtle. So mm. it's interesting. It's interesting. That's yeah i like that idea of subtle mean mindedness because it sort of suggests that we just like i said with this friend example they were kind to a point but it's like not giving your heart fully isn't it it's not giving all your goodwill <laughs> it's holding a bit back yeah to me it seems to also be rooted in a sense of inner poverty uh -huh. it's like i haven't got enough to be able to really give to that you know yeah of course we all have but mm. the, the perception of not having enough here and I wish that I had what they have, or I can't share what I have with them because I don't have enough. There's a sort of a sense of inner poverty that I, I hear when I hear mm. those two. Those two. Mm. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. And well, I, the sense of self is always yeah. prone to yes. a bit of poverty yes. because it's never yeah, quite. That's true. Yeah, that's just it's intrinsically. The inner self is, is impoverished. Yeah, yes. yes. Because it's never quite can make it so yeah because i mean some people come to the spiritual path thinking they'll improve and even perfect themselves they use this mm. word like perfect mm. themselves there is no self you can perfect mm. i mean it is inherently conditioned unreliable suffering mm. etc etc mm. so yeah in that sense it's bound mm. to be flawed mm. and un incapable mm. of bringing happiness mm. yeah it's mm. true it's true yeah that's the mm. thing with this isn't it i guess that closeness is a state of sense of self like i need it or them kind of, of separateness separateness mm -hmm. exactly closeness yeah 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 so i see that our two beaming ladies in the dark <laughs> had their hand up would you like to speak grace or annette or both can, can i move please <laughs> Hey. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Hi. Yeah. You you kind of said what I was gonna say too, but um, yeah, I've I've been noticing that jealousy and envy arise when with mm -hmm. like people that are really really similar to me, and mm -hmm. it feels like this like mm -hmm. we have all the same conditionings, and so like so many conditionings are overlapping that it's like the sort of primal survivalist fear instinct comes in of like not enough room for both of us and not, not enough for both of us so we're both if we're both aiming at the same goals then we can't both get the same goals so like that survive or the competition comes in of like this is <laughs> like i gotta win you can't win or something like this. 
that oh, is so mm -hmm. interesting and perceptive mm -hmm. because it makes me yeah mm -hmm. I relate to like if it's somebody who's so different from you it's like mm -hmm. well they're different so it doesn't matter mm -hmm. right it's not like there's a sort of ground where you, it, comparison even makes mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. and it also makes sense in the sense of where you see the conflict in the world it's between two leaders usually two mm -hmm. white men actually sorry but it's true because most of them are white men you know <laughs> at least in the in the yeah, white based crazy. countries but um you know it's when we're yeah people people of a similar yeah. age yeah. wanting the similar things yeah, yeah. and yeah. then there's a competition there yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. it's very interesting so so when that comes up then um you're aware of that at the time how, mm -hmm. how are you aware how does it affect you i noticed this sort of yeah like holding on to like the the deepest things that I identify as me are at question and at mm -hmm. stake and so I, I notice like oh but I'm smart and like oh but I'm yeah whatever it is you know mm -hmm. and it's like I see that and then it feels really painful <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 well it's great that you can feel that it's dukkha mm -hmm. because I think sometimes we don't know and we're just trapped in these things right and uh, yeah. it's kind of considered sort of normal in the world it's like how competitive are you you know are you going to push forward in your job you need to be aggressive and competitive <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you very much could I just come to the chat actually to answer uh from a few people who haven't spoken yeah. yet and then we'll come to Mukund Thanks for sharing, Grace. Mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> I always love your insights. Mm. How about liking something wholesome such as Dhamma? Does it lead to dispute? <laughs> I would say no. Well, not really. <laughs> I mean, I guess there can be some instances where if it turns into craving or kind of wanting even wholesome feelings to last, it can lead to sort of conflict within, especially if it gets into like, oh, I want that peaceful state that I used to have. And that can lead to a kind of inner conflict. It can come up, of course, even with they're a better meditator than me, you know. <laughs> but if it's really kind of liking as in inclining and, and being inspired by something wholesome, I don't think it leads to dispute. I think it leads out of it. I think we don't need to be afraid of that because, you know, sometimes in the Dhamma we can look and say, oh dear, be careful not to get attached to this wholesome state. But nobody ever says, oh, be careful don't, not to get attached to sex or not get to get attached to like indulgence. So why do we have to have all these warnings on meditation? I mean, obviously we have to approach it in a in a wholesome and in a um, ethical way. Um, but generally speaking, the Dhamma is leading you out of dispute that's kind of one of the attributes of dhamma to make peace to kind of settle the conflict externally as well as internally i would say do you want to do the next one okay machi yeah. from my observation machi. from my observation this elaboration of perception and notions is stronger when there is no contact or proximity with another person Ah, stronger. If they are not near, it is much easier to fabricate worst versions of their intentions in your mind. Oh dear. I think it is good to constantly check your thoughts about other people, persons by asking. Yes. Them. Yeah. 100%. Right. Right. Communication. That's true. That's true. Absolutely. That's true. But sometimes we are scared to ask because we don't know. It might say they might say something that we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's so. For me, I'm far more insecure and scared about silence. Mm -hmm. I like to talk. Mm -hmm. That is my safe zone. Silence and areas where people might be thinking something and they're not coming to you to mm -hmm. ask is a really dangerous zone for me. Uh, so I really agree, actually, that it's great to check our thoughts and ask them and, and ask in a way that's very open mm. sort of oh did you feel not kind of did you have this mean thought about me <laughs> not that but how are you feeling you know when you said such and such was there something mm -hmm. happening there for you mm -hmm. or I don't know ask in a skillful way mm -hmm. um, and basically asking gives them the sense that there's room for them to be heard there's room for them to uh, be heard I think is the most important thing you know you're not just landing mm -hmm. on a 
mm. a fixed perception because for me personally that feels so uncomfortable when I'm in a box and there's nothing I can do to get out of it and I have to kind of oh no but I didn't mean it that way mm. <laughs> uh, but sometimes you just have to um, accept that people have they have so maybe some wrong view but you look at yourself and go well did I mean anything by it mm. did I mean anything by it and sometimes you do you know sometimes mm. sometimes you do which is why you feel a bit out yourself yeah you feel yeah, a bit off. off because you yourself you know that there was yeah, something a bit yes yes mm. um, and you yourself have done something that you know you feel not quite so good about right when it's something yeah. done but there can be times when there isn't anything exactly. that's been off exactly. but the other person still exactly. might misunderstand exactly. i just think exactly. we can do a certain amount of work on mm. our own but in in the case of social and calming and harmony in the case of harmony between people in relationships i don't think it's enough i think it's yeah i don't know what do you think i uh, both mm. i guess but i was thinking as she was speaking i was thinking about mm intention which is obviously so important mm. so if, if you know that, that your intention was not to cause harm mm. it wasn't you mm. know it's been that your intention been misperceived mm. you know that you can you can rest in that inside you don't have to feel oh my gosh they think that and that mm. Mm. there can be a certain resting in that mm. and then you can still do the repair as best you can on the outside mm. but i think there is a certain taking refuge in one's intention mm. And then, yeah. and then also, and, and often nowadays, they're speaking about intention versus impact. Yeah. So then you have to see what was the impact. Right. And maybe the, maybe one has something to learn from it or, yeah. But, yeah, because I think, yes, refuge was intention, but I just don't think it's enough. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a basis from which to, to meet the other. Because if you're... To meet the other, yeah sort of off center and thinking oh gosh they think this about me and mm, yeah, yeah 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 then it's all it becomes all about oneself again mm, yeah you know, rather than yeah, you yeah. Know, like oh actually no i did that was the tool what i intended and right. there obviously suffering mm, because sure. of some mistake that i've made or right, mis right. misperception then you can actually meet them rather than yeah that's true if it leads to that step you, if it leads to that step right. yeah mm. i agree i think the thing for me is i've heard it said before oh I checked my intention and that was the end of it. And it just feels like it can be a bypassing of having to uh, uh, then do the reparation or then take care about the impact because mm -hmm. intention alone isn't quite enough. Like mm -hmm. I think a deeper sensitivity can come when we actually learn about triggers for others and mm -hmm. we can't stop them being triggered and it's not necessarily advisable to because we have to work mm -hmm. with what we have. Mm -hmm. But I mean, one of the reasons I always do a check-in here is just know how people are doing and some people might feeling tired or might be feeling this way or that way some might not have a bad intention but maybe i could have a better one to look after them or mm. do you know mm. what i mean yeah mm. um i think in terms of how many it's not mm. enough to just sit back and say well mm. i didn't mean anything it's their problem yeah um mm. that could be the danger there mm. only but yeah i get i get the point of having to find that um mm. ease within first mm. if we're moving out yeah yeah definitely. yeah it's interesting this person saying about it's easy to fabricate mm. yeah when uh they're not there i really mm. think that's true because mm. again it's getting further and further away from mm. direct experience isn't it mm. it's becoming memory and mm. you know we remember the things that maybe trigger us or uh that's the way the mind's prone primed to look for alert signals dangers whatever Hey, we're here from Susie now. These are all our recent guests. <laughs> hey. so, Susie, may I ask you to unmute, please? Um, Hello, Venerables. Hello. <laughs> so lovely to see you all. And nice to see all the guests that I've also uh, met. Yeah. Veronica and Annette and Gracia. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I just wanted to quickly reflect on uh, how important the communication was in situations like that um i have a i have a very close friend of mine she's probably one of my closest friends and we have situations many times when this kind of um, i don't i won't even say competition but some sort of 
envy situations, partly also because we are very similar and that is a thing. <laughs> and um, we've just developed a very honest and clear communication system. Mm -hmm. So we both reflect on ourselves and we share it with each other. So we would ask, when you said that, I mm -hmm. thought it meant this. Did it really mean that or not? <laughs> mm -hmm. And 99%, I mean, I can't even think of actually one occasion when it was true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, you know, so it always turns out that, oh, <laughs> that was really not, not what I thought it was. All right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's just such a wholesome thing because, yeah, mm -hmm. communication wow. is very wow. important. <laughs> It yeah, must be a lot of trust. Good statistic, exactly. <laughs> to undermine your own thoughts and then to create a lot of trust together. A lot of learning from each other, definitely. Yeah. I mean, from my side, at least. I don't know. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's very non threatening, isn't it, when you approach that way? It's very non threatening for the other, you know, this is what I thought. You're being vulnerable, actually, which is, I think, why it goes. Yes. Well. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm. We should have that as a little uh, mm. in the core what? <laughs> <laughs> There's such a thing. In the monastery rule. As in the, uh, yeah, if you, if you in doubt, ask. try this. Yeah. Try this little perception. Go meditate, do some meta, mm. and then approach. Mm. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Mm. Good. I mean, we don't always do it right. I mean, just to say that we can have these things, like these ideals, we don't always do it right. And we have to accept yeah. that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I buy into my thoughts too yeah. often. Especially when they're triggered, you know, when the thought goes along with a feeling that's very intense, right, you know, right, it's like right, right, that right. time it really seems to have some ground. Yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, great statistic. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you, I don't, shall we read it out? I guess you're a bit far away. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll read it and maybe you could. Uh, oh, what was the yeah. earlier one? Oh. Using that inner refuge so that you're making reparations out of care and compassion for the mm. other person instead of trying to make amends so you can feel better mm. in a way that's based on self view and a desire to be liked. That is yeah. absolutely what we were saying in a very that's concise right. and articulate yeah. way. Fantastic yeah, summary. Very nice. yeah. We should keep this yeah. chat box. I wonder if one of our well, co-hosts can. Copy paste this chat box so that we can learn later from it. Mm. Okay, so I'll read Leona's question mm. out and maybe Nanda Bodhi can reflect. Actually, we only have about two minutes now. Mm. So uh, I guess this is the last comment for today. I reckon we could make this a double session. <laughs> we all have things to do. All right. I find that sometimes conversations, asking the other about what they meant or explaining what I meant, can also complicate mm. a situation. Yeah. Mm. Mm. and create new fabrications about what's happening mm. yeah it can be endless mm. the other person and myself mm. sometimes I find it's better to refer to something that connects us and let the other problem go yeah mm. wonderful mm. that's good mm. yeah so I, I, something I've had to learn to you know mm. zip up from time mm. to time because there can be a tendency to want to clarify and mm. you know make sure the person really understand you know and, and sometimes it's better just to let it go mm. yeah and, and that's just Discernment, isn't it? And there, is, there are things that, that really do need to be taken care of and attended to, and there are things that can just be let go. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. And I like that uh, that um, emphasis on on putting energy into something that's that will connect you rather than mm. trying to sort out yeah. what's going on here. It's lovely. That's beautiful. That's mm. watering the flowers, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. And uh, I, from the perspective of being in the monastery, it can be way too much to mm. talk through air. Really, oh, no. my goodness! Oh, I mean, oh, boy. You've just come from doing like a massive newsletter seven hours online, and then yikes! You just want to have a little bit of everyone caring for one another, and yeah. But I think the mm. times to do it for me anyway can be if you see a certain mm. pattern that's kind of stuck, mm. and then it's happening again mm. and again, and it's kind of like there's more suffering being made by leaving mm. it than by just mm. approaching it. But then, yeah, finding the right time, mm. the right way, asking the other, is it a good time? Mm. Is very important, I think. Mm. You know, following those five guidelines mm. that Buddha said, that it should be the right time, should be beneficial, should be true, mm. should be done gently and with metta. Mm. Gently and with metta. Mm. So, yeah, but I love that. Mm. Connecting us. Mm. Yeah, because problems are endless. Mm. 
Mm. Problems are endless. Mm. So, and there's an endless yeah. capacity for goodness and, and love and care mm. and all kinds of ways we can look after one another. And I think there's never too much of it, you know. This is one thing we some people say you can have too much meta. I just totally disagree. If it's really meta, right? If it's really not the whole thing, mm. you can't have enough. All right. So I think it's uh time to close. And I wonder if Manoy is going to say a few words. Happy Vesak. Oh yes, happy Vesak. Well, it's Vesak. one of the Vesaks. There's many Vesaks this year. And next in June, there's a big Vesak that we're celebrating in our community anyway. I don't know what we're gonna do. I don't know if we're gonna do anything particularly special. But if anyone wants to come here that day, I guess you can. That'd be the easiest for us. Just tell the group and see if it turns up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. talk about the Buddha and his qualities that we all have in latent form mm -hmm. all right so thank you all we'll mm -hmm. say a bit more afterwards because actually we just opened up a lot of very very wonderful events for you to book up mm -hmm. into quickly so mm -hmm. yeah yeah if I talk a little bit I, I'll start I st like to start talking about the events mm -hmm. um uh, the events page has everything, but then I want to highlight there is a retreat by both Venerable Supeka and Chanda uh, called Wisdom and Forgiveness. And then also the latest Ajahn Brahm's tour details are there. You would have seen in the latest newsletter and also it is in the website now. Mm -hmm. And as you know, today's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And um, uh, you can use the buttons in the website to donate um, any donation that you've given. Any contribution that you're able to make is gratefully received and uh, it will be used for the upkeep of the Vihara uh, and day-to-day -day running of the Vihara and also the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. I love that part. <laughs> every day <laughs> and I'm now going to paste a link of the donation thing and if you if you are able to serve in any other ways help to get involved in any other ways of the project and the Vihara uh, please contact team at anukampaproject.org there's a dana you can do that is the food donations uh, you can visit physically and give, or you can arrange a remote uh, dana, uh, or you can do things like the supermarket deliveries. And there are a couple of groups as well uh, to get involved in different things. So please contact team at anukampaproject.org and mm. explain your speciality and the times and the reliability and all. So um, uh, we need a good, reliable volunteers thank you thank you so much would you mind just popping the email address in there in the chat for anyone who's new and uh yeah just to reiterate really that the retreat that venerable pecker and i are teaching is on june the 17th it's in cambridge it's a one-day retreat so um i'm sorry grace you'll have to stay longer just for that <laughs> just kidding <laughs> but she's extended her stay since february basically <laughs> extending 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 which is great. And uh, and then uh, Ajahn Brahm's tour is happening in November. Ajahn Brahm Ali is coming in like less than a week. Mm. So it's just too much. It's so much. And um, mm. I heard from a couple of people that you weren't able to get tickets for Ajahn Brahm Ali through the systems we have. Just turn up at this stage. Mm. Just turn up. You can, you know, give whatever funds are needed on the door. There's loads of space in all the talks. So we really would love to see you. Mm. And um, a big piece of the project that has to shift from myself to the group is organizing these tours because it's too much. Now I'm running a monastery. Mm. And uh, I have said it before, it's not that you don't know. It's just that we need people who are really committed. And I know that there's a few people here like Sean and maybe Grace who can help going mm. forward. But, and I know, you know, we have to talk about it in more detail, mm. which we will do in due course. I just, Actually, I'm quite hoarse at the moment and haven't got any time outside of all these uh, event organizings. Mm. So, but we will talk about it and we want to put together a really great retreat organization team 
not just so we can bring Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali, but so I can also teach more retreats in England because what's happening is I'm getting a lot of invitations to teach retreats overseas. And because they organize it, I say yes, but really I'd love to do more here so that I can build a local or at least a national support base here. And I think, you know, yeah, England's pretty lovely in, in springtime and it would be just nice to give people from this community more opportunities so we do need people to make those things happen so if you have particular skills and significant amounts of time or at least enough to make it worth contributing to a team effort that would be great and in the long run we're looking to expand our trust team as well and also I don't know I think it's an idea to have a membership kind of thing but we'll need help changing in the constitution for that so big big ideas but i was told recently i think by minori and a lovely group of people who came recently that this is actually a very positive time in a project it's not that things are going wrong which i thought it was it's actually a sign of needing to grow mm -hmm. it's like a bod waiting to burst and it needs to have a new structure mm -hmm. that's much more solid because we're not a small mm -hmm. thing anymore so we actually have more funds in the bank ready for when i have more, more people living here and we can get a bigger place mm -hmm when we have more structures in place. Mm. So that's what's needed now. Mm. All right. So uh, thank you everybody for being here and from all over the world. I know there's someone from Australia, someone from India, like people from America, there's people from all over the place. Annette and Grace are in Berlin, Ruth Annette. And yes, it's just wonderful. Susie's in Wales, I told you she's studying in uh, uh, Swansea, Swansea, but you finished, right? So well done, well done. And uh, Bill's in America. Anyway, mm. meta to you all. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry.